So turn with me to uh, the book of Ephesians in chapter 3, and I'm going to uh, read some verses. In the end, uh, we're going to pray Paul's prayer together, uh, which comes at the end of um, chapter 3, and it's one of the two big prayers in in the letter, and I guess you're familiar with this letter. So in chapter 2, just to catch you up, uh, Paul introduces the idea of the inclusion of the Gentiles into the kingdom, into Christ's church, and then He says these incredible words at the end of chapter 2. He says, consequently, you are no longer... That's us, actually, by the way. Like, we are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. We sort of presume that. But something spectacular happened in order for us to be that. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him, the whole building is joined together together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. So this morning we are this gathering, which is the living temple where the Spirit of God dwells in us and among us. Spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. Okay, so here's our text for this morning. Chapter 3, uh, verse 1. I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 13. He starts off saying, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then he loses track. He kind of deviates and he goes into verse 2. And I'll explain that a little bit later. He says, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you which are your glory. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we um, gather ourselves now to hear your word, we pray that you will make yourself known through your presence among us, through your spirit, that you'll open our minds and our hearts to receive your word and to behold Jesus, to see him, and um, also at the same time to behold um, that we are together with one another and that that is a glorious thing in your sight. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want to uh, begin this morning uh, by uh, stimulating uh, your imagination, just your thoughts, by telling you a little story. Okay, And hopefully that is going to uh, land (laughs) at the end. So here's my story. A master builder and his young apprentice were commissioned to build an elaborate palace. After many years, they reached the final stage, this palatial dome that they had to build, but they noticed that the plans were opaque. The plans were kind of secret. There was nothing on the plans, really, to see. They're cryptic. They couldn't work it out. It was sort of purposely obscure, in a way. Now, presuming the design unfinished and having collaborated with this incredible architect over a long period... The master builder decided to approach him with a suggestion of his own. Okay, let me show you how we could do this final piece. So the architect received them. He listened patiently as the master builder explained his idea. 
And then he responded with a broad smile. Without saying a word, he walked over to the side and he pulled open a drawer, and in the drawer he extracted this massive sealed envelope, sealed, and, and he tore it open, and he spread out what is his original plan for that palatial dome. It was absolutely magnificent, elaborate. And uh, the master builder just stared at it. There were some elements that he could have come up with himself. He could have conceived it. But the architect's plan was resplendent, beyond imagination. Really something spectacular. I was waiting for you to be ready for this design, the architect said. If I had revealed these plans to you right at the outset, you would have given up. You would have said, this is impossible. This just cannot be done. It's impossible. But now, having prepared everything else, you are now finally ready to see it just like I had imagined it and how I designed it right from the start. Oh, the architect put on, and one more thing, right? I'd like your apprentice to take the lead in finishing this project. I've been following him closely. I think he's ready for it. Okay, now imagine... You were that young apprentice, right? And you were brought into this surprising meeting with this incredible unveiling with your master builder, and suddenly you, you, you are present, unexpected, in this incredible little gathering. And there you are. You're privy to it. It's, it's quite extraordinary. And then the even more extraordinary thing happened. You get commissioned to take that project on. Now, you can see where this is going if you had followed the text, <laughs> that is, this is perhaps how the Apostle Paul felt when he was introduced to this great plan of God by God himself in his personal encounter with Jesus, right? And then that he had been given this unexpected honor to take, to rather to bring that design to life, to take this message, this gospel to the Gentiles. So that's where we're going this morning. And my hope is that when we begin to see what this master plan looked like, we can figure out where Lakeside Chapel fits into it. Um, I really, it's really nice to be among you. We pastored a church in Canada for many years, which was very, very similar to, uh, this was also a little chapel and very much a community church in a small, on a small island. So a great affinity for this kind of gathering. So there are three points I'm going to offer you this morning. Uh, Paul said, don't give them any points because then they'll expect me to do the same. Um, but I'm going to give you three points. Anyway, you can figure out where they come in. And they are the mystery of the gospel, the ministry of the gospel, and the majesty of the gospel. So there you go. Mystery, ministry, and majesty. So let's begin with mystery. Okay, so I'm going to actually just take you through the text slowly and we're going to make our way through it. Verse 1, we read this. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then he breaks off. It's like he loses the plot just right there, the word imprisonment. Remember he's writing this letter from prison and he's like, okay, wait a minute. Okay, and then he, he goes on a little tangent. He deviates from where he was going comes back to that, actually, if you look at verse 14, if you have your Bible open, you'll see there, for this reason. So, between verse 2 and verse 13, we have a little tangent, a digression, and it's a glorious digression. So, we are going to spend our morning on a digression. Okay, right, so, it turns out to be pretty amazing. Well, well the question is, really, Paul wants to tell you why he would go to prison. So once he men mentions imprisonment, he goes, okay, let me just substantiate why it was worth it to be in this position. So what is it that drives Paul? I think that's the thing that we're going to discover here. What drives this man? And I think we should be reminded uh, that his journey to prison in Rome, where, where he's writing this letter from, this is one of his sort of prison letters, um, began actually in Jerusalem when he was charged falsely, if you remember, um, for having taken a Gentile man, one Trophimus of Ephesus, a character from this place to which he's writing this letter, uh, he was charged of having taken this guy into the temple. Now, of course, there's signs all over the temple. Gentiles come, can't come in here by order of death, you know, and so they 
conjured up this false story that Paul had taken Trophimus into uh, into uh, the the, um, the temple with him, and then there's a commotion, and he's held without trial for two years. Eventually, he appeals to being a Roman citizen. He appeals to Caesar, and of course, that's the journey all the way across to Rome where he then finds himself, and ironically, from prison. You want to read the most beautiful verses, the last two verses of the book of Acts, where Paul is under house arrest and how he proclaims freely the kingdom of God. Wonderful. Like, you know, what a glorious imprisonment, in a sense. And he's leading the churches through letters that he writes from there. So that gives us a window into what is driving Paul. And the window is this that it is exactly his associations as a Jew with Gentiles that lands him in the predicament that he's in. Okay, you've got to just take that on board because we don't have those categories. But here is a Jew of Jews associating with the Gentiles, right, promoting the gospel in their favor, and it's exactly because of that association that he ends up in jail. That's why he's saying in verse 1, I am there for the sake of the Gentiles. Okay. So there it is. I'm just telling you the story that you know already. And so the passion behind his actions is what he calls in verse 3, the mystery made known to me by revelation. Okay. I get there slowly, but we're getting there. So <laughs> the mystery. So that's what we're going to look at. What is this mystery? It's in four verses in this text. And uh, this is really what the whole passage, in a sense, is about. What is this mystery? So... Uh, the Greek word mysterion, which is sometimes translated as mystery, sometimes translated as a secret, uh, is uh, ironically exactly the opposite of what we often think we ought to, what it, what it should mean, right? The word mystery in our minds means something vague, obscure, right? Hidden, <laughs> uh, purposefully ambiguous. That's what we think of the word mystery, or some of us think the word secret is something then that is only known to a few people. Oh, I have the secret. Follow me. I have the secret to the kingdom. Nobody else has it. I have it. That's how we normally read the word mystery. Um, but actually it's very simple. As Stuart Briscoe um, speaks very eloquently on Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. For those of you who know that verse, it's a glorious verse. You know, the secret things belong to me. The hidden thing, uh, sorry, the hidden things belong to me. The unveiled things that are, are for you to keep so that you know what you should do. Anyway, Stuart Briscoe says this. He says, and I love this statement, he says, there are things in this world of ours that only God can know. And there are things that we can know if God should choose to reveal them to us. Do you get that? I think we struggle with that. Very difficult for us to hold to the idea of a God who actually holds things, right? In, in fact, sometimes even withholds himself, as we saw in that psalm so eloquently expressed, right? And yet then makes that present. The irony, of course, in this, te in this text then is that, that this word mystery then means a truth that God has kept hidden but has now revealed. In fact, the word mystery in the New Testament means then almost exactly the opposite of what we mean with it in our culture, right? Something that God has kept, but now he's made it known. It's like an open secret. Okay, That's uh, what it is. And it's very much like the architect unfolding his original plan, and it is glory, glorious. Now, note the next thing that this mystery has been given to Paul and is therefore come to us through Paul to the Ephesians. Note the personal pronouns in this text. I think we are uncomfortable with these. So if you look at verse 2, for example, 2 to 4, he said, Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me. As I've already myself written briefly in reading this, you will be able to understand my insight. Okay? You go like, ah, oh. this guy is, um, might be a little conceited. Verse 7, I became a servant through the grace given me. Verse 8, although I'm less than the least of the Lord's people, grace was given to me. Okay? So you say to yourself maybe, sure, what audacity. Who does he think he is? 
But of course, it's not only him. Look at verse 5. The Spirit has also revealed this mystery to God's holy apostles and prophets. What's Paul trying to tell us? Well, undoubtedly in his mind, he has this, that it is the eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus who have the authority to proclaim the truth of Jesus. This event that has no precedent in history, God entering time and space and history and walking among us, there are no precedents in history for that. And he's saying this unprecedented event, we are the witnesses to that. And if you want to have fellowship with that truth, you have to have fellowship with us. Okay. So I think that's important because that's why the, how the Bible functions in relation to our faith. We have access to this truth through this eyewitness account. It's wonderful. Okay. What is this mystery? Finally, we're going to get there. What is this unveiling? Well, it is simply this, that God from eternity in his original plan had always determined to include Gentiles. And you go like, that doesn't sound like a big deal, like we're all Gentiles. Actually, it's a very big deal. In other words, all the human beings that God has included who are not Jews into his people who predominantly are Jews is actually something extraordinary, especially if they can come in with equal, on equal terms, right? Or with equal benefits, okay? So this, the gospel teaches us, is what Jesus accomplished. This is Paul's big deal at this point. Not only as the Jewish Messiah, but Jesus as the Messiah, the King of all the nations. Now, friends, it's hard to actually get behind this because this really is an extraordinary event. You know, uh, um, we, we take this absolutely uh, for granted. But in the Jewish mind of Paul, there are only two groups of humans on the planet. I mean, we've got this great diversity across the world and, and we live in this age of diversity and equality and equity and so on. But in the mind of Paul, it's really simple. There are Jews and there are non-Jews, right? These are the saved people, these are the lost people. These are the good people, these are the bad people, right? Those two communities, and that includes all the nations. And that's the Jewish mind, right? And now, God has done something that could that seems to be impossible. He has joined these two enemy, these mortal enemies, these races, mutually exclusive of one another. He's joined into one. And in Galatians, Paul puts this very clearly. He says this in chapter three. He says, In Christ Jesus, you see, we know these truths, but 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 on the landscape of uniformity, of religious uniformity for, for aeons. What Paul is doing is literally like chucking a nuclear bomb out there and saying, wait a minute, God is... And they go like, no, no, no. This is why Paul is such a persecuted person in reality in his own time. This is what he says in Galatians. In Christ Jesus, all are children of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. So he starts with that. Neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir again according to the promise. So this is extraordinary in its time. In fact, it's not just in ex extraordinary in its time. It might be pretty extraordinary in our time. Imagine we airdrop Paul into the Gaza Strip as a Jew. Just let your imagination run for a while. Who's going to take him out? The good guys or the bad guys? Well, for the position he takes, the good guys are going to take him out, right? So it's not just extraordinary in his time. It's actually extraordinary in our time. And a world as divided as ours, to hold this view is always counter the culture. It's cross-current. Now, you want to ask yourself, why would Paul, as a Jew, then be so excited about this? Well, in verse 15, if you look further down the text, he says this. He says, God is proving himself to be the Father and Lord of all the nations. Wouldn't that be a non-negotiable for you? That the one true God, who is the creator God, would be the Father of all nations? Would you not have dismissed God out of hand? 
If he's only the God of one ethnic people, if that God who made everything could not be the God who could be the God over all nations, you would have dropped him straight away. So this makes Paul very excited. And especially because in his lordship, Christ is able to do something that no human being can do. No human engineering or religious agenda or winsome philosophy or sociological experiment or educational program. Don't you always marvel at, at people coming up with incredible schemes? Oh, this will bring people together. Oh, this is how we're going to solve this conflict. And you look at it. Here we are, like in 2024. And the conflicts are still there. They're the same. In fact, they look a lot worse. And yet God has been able to do it through the power of his spirit moving amongst people, doing that which is utterly and absolutely impossible for human beings to do. You have to marvel at that. And Paul is marveling at it. Also, he becomes exceptionally excited about his role in that, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Okay, so that means what God has done in the church is extraordinary. And if at any point we then bring division into that unity that is brought by God. There's a great warning, friends. Great warning. So this is really what drives Paul, is God's mystery, the transcendent reality of God's new community, conceived in ages past and now revealed. Okay, our second point, the ministry of the gospel. This one's going to be quick. So, In case you're doing the time math, maths in your, the back of your head. So not only has God graciously revealed to Paul a mystery, he has graciously given him a ministry. Look at verse 7 to 9. It said, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Let this fact not escape you, that Paul, or Saul, was a violent man, an aggressor, someone who destroyed families, someone who destroyed individuals, someone at whose hand, and as a result of it, there was blood. Okay, And he knows it. And he knows the prejudice that drove him to do that. And instinctively he knew that this gospel, this message of Jesus, that as it crept and it took root amongst people, brought about a transformation that he in his ethnic superiority could not tolerate. And he had to hunt it down and kill it. You found those seeds of thought in your own heart and mind? They're there for sure, unless the gospel subdues it. Now, it's really interesting. In verse 1, he calls himself not a prisoner of Nero. Now, there was a violent chap for you. Okay? Doesn't call himself a prisoner of Nero. It would be so easy to say, I am here a prisoner of this wicked, evil man, Nero. But he doesn't. <laughs> Look what he says. He says, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles. Yo, something's happened to this, this guy. He is a transformed man. There's something very different. I, I look at that and I think to myself, how would I say that? How would I be in that position? And in verse 13, he asks them not to be discouraged about his sufferings because even his suffering is, in fact, their glory. Friends, we read over the Bible and we just go, okay, he's just saying these things. He means it. Now, why would he say that? Verse 8, he has been given this incredible gift to proclaim the wealth, the overflowing goodness. Oh, we cut God short. Is God good? No, he's not just, eh, he's good. Like, I, I will let it come out of my mouth. His, his goodness overflows. His goodness is without bounds. His goodness is extraordinary. And the heart that is evil can't tolerate this goodness of God. It takes offense at God for his lavish generosity. 
And so Paul has been chosen to let everybody know that this is an open secret, the infinite goodness of God, that he offers the nations. And friends, that's us. Here we are this morning. We are inheritors of the promise. This extraordinary, lavish goodness of God. He's giving to us, who along, if you track history, actually are not really, by obvious means, included in that plan. Yet God turns to us and he gives us an equal inheritance, an equal belonging, equal participation, equal share in God's promises in Jesus. And so we make a big mistake. We look at Paul and we think, oh, that's not my lot. His retirement plan, shame. Prison in Rome, I'm in Betty's. It's good, yeah. So grateful, of course. We are grateful. But when we look at Paul in prison, we see a man contained, right? A man inhibited. But he doesn't see it. He sees freedom and privilege. He has new eyes. When we see Paul and we look at his suffering, we see a life under duress. What he sees is joy and God's favor. What does it take for us to see things the way we ought to see them? And the answer to that question really is the best part of this passage. And that is to see things how God sees them. And that's our third point, the majesty of the gospel. So now we come to actually the nicest verses. If you're going to hang in there, please do now. Verse 10 and 11. God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Note this. Not just the watching world, but the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word manifold is the same word that's used of Joseph's technicolor dream coat. <laughs> it's the same word. It's this variegated, multifaceted beauty. It's like a jewel. You look at it from different aspects and the color is different every time. It's magnificent to behold. My daughter is a fashion designer. They've just had a show and some of those garments are um, just magnificent. You want to look at them. Some of them are awful, but <laughs> some of them are truly magnificent. So when the Church of Christ gathers in all of its cultural diversity, we, we're in, in the international church in Stellenbosch, so it's truly diverse. But even here, the diversity is extraordinary. And we're not just talking about, about the obvious differences, but there are deep differences in culture and heritage and thinking and education it's phenomenal, right? So when the church gathers with all this diversity in its many splendid, many sided unity, it's like a multifaceted jewel, and it puts on display this beauty and wonder, which is the marvel of God's wisdom. People drive past here and they go, Oh, those naive Christians. <laughs> what naivety. Oh, what fools. God looks and he said, look how beautiful. Look at my wisdom. Right? And we need to be reminded of that. That this is the wisdom of God on display. The church is the centerpiece in the crown of Christ the King. The crowning jewel of the gospel. Absolutely. God's wisdom on display, not just before the watching world, but before rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So here, I think we have one of the most powerful statements in all of the New Testament regarding God's intent with the church. It is actually quite surprising. So in putting the wisdom of God on display, the church actually testifies against the powers we together are a testimony this morning against the powers, the rulers, the authorities, visible and invisible, in the heavenly realms. And what we put on display here is that Christ is king. Amongst all the powers and authorities, heavenly and earthly, Jesus is king, that God and Christ rules, that his new community on earth is no small thing that the kingdom of God will 
triumph. Tom Wright says the following. He says, Earthly authorities and their shadowy heavenly counterparts tend to create societies and social structures in their own flat image, monochrome, uniform, one-dimensional. They tend to marginalize or kill people or groups who don't fit their narrow band of acceptability. Christ's church is a warning to them that their time is up and an announcement to the world that there is now in Christ a different way to be human. Friends, the church, our gathering, our fellowship, this fellowship this morning across the world in many, many places is God's greatest work. When the church is not some place we go, but something we are, God's new community, then that is God's prime work. And if that is God's primary work, the question is, how important is it to you? I, we came in here this morning and, I, and I, I just had a great sense of relief. You are here not because of your culture or because something's been brought to you. You decided to come here this morning. You decided to be a part of that. And I have no doubt that you are actively involved in the things that happen here and amongst the people of this place. The truth is we all have our own story with the church, right? We all have our own bad story of the church. We all have some story to tell of something that's happened that was unpleasant. Or, especially in a small community like this, very much like our church in community in Canada, you know, you, 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 you struggle with your identity. You go like, oh, we're insignificant, right? Like, really, what is this? Why are we doing this? Or you think you are extraordinarily significant. <laughs> Those are the two tendencies, and very seldom the thing that's in the middle. Okay, so this is truly wonderful. I, I remember, um, you know, as we passed this church in Canada, it was very, very difficult, and I just, I said to my wife all the time, um, sure, you know, all we've, and you, know, you struggle to build that community, and you know, the smaller the village, the bigger the world, you know, the smaller the family, the bigger the problems because everybody knows exactly what's going on. So you have all these peculiar things that happen in a small community. And uh, we always just say to each other, it's important. On every Sunday, we show up because when we show up, we testify of God's wisdom before the watching world, both, vis both visible and invisible. Remember that. Nothing spectacular has to happen here, but it has to happen. <laughs> because it is spectacular, more so than you realize. Okay, so I think just if you are this morning sitting thinking, well, I'm just going to come here every Sunday, um, and I don't mean with that the antidote is get super involved and do everything, um, but I think we have to stop wavering in our minds about how important church is. We have to stop being doubtful of that. This is of extreme significance what you're doing, beyond your imagination. Your presence here in this community, Peter writes about the church as living stones being built together. You are a stone that is actually being spliced together in this particular place, in this particular way, under God's hand of providence. Don't look for somewhere else or someplace else or something that might be that is not. It is here and now being spliced together where God is at work. So Paul had made his mind up. If Christ was worth dying for and Christ had died for the church, then Paul said, I would die for the church. And I'm sure if you talk to Paul, you ask him what's the most important thing that any young man can do or any person can do, and it is to labor for this purpose. Okay. So friends, if this is God's plan for the world, my question to you is, where are you in this plan? How do you fit into this plan? Okay, let me close for us. So last night, just to share something, maybe last night I was looking at, at I don't know if you guys are reading the news, maybe you either read nothing or you read everything, you know, and the, the world is, is actually just hunky-dory because you don't know or you know everything and you're depressed about it. But the world's not a good place if you looked out there. And what God doing amongst a community like this is something extraordinary. And even this morning, 
what God has done, and it's through everything that's happened here. He's, he's put his wisdom on display before rulers and authorities. Maybe that's something that you can bring with you every Sunday that you come. So what we really need is the eyes to see the things as God sees them. And which is why in the very next verse, verse 14, Paul breaks out in prayer. Because that's the next thing that he does. So this letter is extraordinary. It's half prayer, half information, half explanation. You know, it's just, and half, you know, exhortation. But the prayers are really the, the, the really wonderful parts.